Hi, I'm Chris Green, the History Chap, and by popular demand, I am going to spend the next 30 minutes or so giving you an overview of the Wars of the Roses, this incredible civil war that took place in medieval England. You know, 30 years, 12 battles, five kings, and it changed the face of England and English history forever. So in 30 minutes, this is just going to be a real overview. I can't go into all the, the ins and outs and the intricacies and all the different parts because I'll be honest, you know, the Wars of the Roses are, have more intrigues and twists and turns than a John le Carre novel. But this is a 10,000 foot view of the Wars of the Roses. And in, in it, I'm going to basically explain when did they take place? Uh, who, on earth were the, who on earth was it between? Uh, why were they fighting? What actually happened in the Wars of the Roses and how did they end? So if you're sitting comfortably, let's begin. So let's start with some real top line information. The, the Wars of the Roses were a dynastic dispute within the, the ruling Plantagenet family that erupted into a civil war in England between 1455 and 1485. The Plantagenets were the longest uh, reigning royal house in English history. They reigned for 331 years. Anyway, it pitted two rival parts of the family, the houses of Lancaster and the house of York, against each other. It was known as the War of the Roses because of the emblems adopted by the two sides, the, the White Rose of York versus the Red Rose of Lancaster. Uh, let me introduce the key characters in the Wars of the Roses. So. In the red corner, from the House of Lancaster, we have King Henry VI of England, and also later, Henry Tudor. And in the white corner, representing the House of York, we have Richard of York and his sons, Edward IV and Richard III. And also in this epic tale, we have some incredible women. We have Margaret of Anjou, who fought the wife of Henry VI, who fought for the Lancastrian cause, quite frankly, with far more ferocity and effectiveness than her husband did. We also have Elizabeth Woodville, the commoner whom uh, Edward IV fell in love with and married. And we also have the resilient Margaret Beaufort, the child bride who was left widowed and a single mother at the age of 13. And interestingly, both Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth Woodville were grandmothers to King Henry VIII, and thus great-grandmothers to Queen Elizabeth I. Anyway, so what was the war all about? Well, quite simply, who should wear the crown of England? Two different parts of the family believed that they had the right to wear the crown. It's like the, the ultimate uh, family falling out over a will. And speaking of the, uh, the families falling out on the, on the death of a relative, the problem all started when Edward III, King Edward III of England, died back in 1377. The crown passed to the only child of his deceased eldest son, uh, a boy king, Richard II. However, Richard was actually usurped by his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, whose father was John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, the third son of Edward III. And thanks to that title, the Duke of Lancaster, we have the House of Lancaster. That's where they come from. Henry Bolingbroke was subsequently crowned King Henry IV of England. His son was Henry V of Agincourt fame, and his son, Henry VI, represented the House of Lancaster when the Wars of the Roses broke out and for most of the Wars of the Roses. Meanwhile, the descendants of Edward III's second and fourth sons had ultimately married and their child, Richard, Duke of York, headed up the House of York. Now, Richard of York also believed that, number one, Henry was a poor king under the influence of a small clique of nobles who were on the make. And secondly, that he had actually a stronger claim to the throne. Initially, he seems to have simply wanted to the removal of the clique, advising the king. But over time, this turned into a greater ambition to wear the crown himself. Now, all right, I know we're going at a bit of a gallop here, but I want to keep, keep this tight for you, OK, and a bit of an overview. I mean, I've given a series of talks in the past which uh, go into a lot more detail, uh, but that was a paid course, and this is just an overview for you, OK? Henry wouldn't listen to Richard's overtures about reform, and eventually Richard decided that the time for talking was over, and he raised an army and marched on London to force the king's hand. Henry took action. He raised his own army and he marched out of London to meet the rebel Yorkist army. And on the 22nd of May, 1455, 
They met at the ancient market town of St Albans, which is about 20 miles north of London. And there, in the narrow streets, the war started. A daring attack by Richard of York's ally, the Earl of Warwick, broke into the town, surprising the Lancastrian army, and presented Richard of York with the first victory in the Wars of the Roses. It also presented him with King Henry VI, who was suffering a mental breakdown and had been basically abandoned by his guards uh, in the town. This was a delicate moment for Richard, because Henry VI was the anointed and crowned King of England, and Richard's army believed that Richard just wanted reform. That's what they'd all signed up for, to reform the king's government, to make England a better place, not to kill or remove the king. So with, with Henry incapacitated with his mental breakdown, Richard was promoted to Lord Protector and effectively was running the country on behalf of the king. That was as close as he could get his hands on the crown. And strangely enough, that little clique that was around, uh, around, around the king, uh, they were removed pretty fast. So he was actually reforming like he said he was going to. However, within, within a year, the king's faculties had returned once and uh, the regency was ended. And Richard lost his powerful role as Lord Protector. And with Henry back in charge, the clique returned. And together with Margaret of Anjou, his, uh, his wife, they looked for revenge on Richard. By 1459, three years later, they had persuaded the king to finally declare Richard of York a traitor. And any hope that Richard had of pursuing a, a peaceful resolution was now gone. Once more, he gathered an army, this time at Ludlow on the English Welsh border. And he urged the Neville family, of whom one of his members was the Earl of Warwick, to bring troops down from, from their power base in Yorkshire. Margaret of Anjou attempted to prevent these two forces joining. And she tried to intercept them at a place called Bloor Heath, which is just outside a tiny market town of Market Drayton in Shropshire. However, they were actually defeated. 3,000 men were killed on the, the fields of uh, uh, Bloor Heath. And it's, it's amazing. I went there last summer. And it's just amazing that in these peaceful fields, over 3,000 Englishmen died on that afternoon. Uh, having pushed Margaret's army out of the way, they moved down and they did join up. Uh, the Yorkist forces joined at Ludlow. However, very shortly afterwards, Henry VI himself arrived at Ludlow with the Royal Army. And Richard's force started to desert. Remember, they had risen, they were supporting Richard for good government. They were not wanting to be traitors and they had no, problem, no problems with Henry VI, their crowned King of England. So they started to desert and, and Richard rapidly realised that he was horribly outnumbered now and he had to flee into exile with his allies, key allies and his children. The Wars of the Roses is, is like some sort of heavy, heavyweight boxing contest or maybe a, maybe a classic tennis match. You know, one side on top, then the other, then back, then forward. And we're going to see this as I continue the talk now with you. The House of Lancaster were on top and it was the House of York who had had to flee the country. But that all changed a year later in 1460. Richard of York's teenage son, Edward, Earl of March, and the Earl of Warwick, hero of St Albans, landed in, in England and were welcomed in London as heroes. They then moved north and they met the king and his army at Northampton. And thanks in part to treachery inside the king's army, Edward, Earl of March, and the Earl of Warwick won the Battle of Northampton. And once again, they captured the king, who, who once again was having a mental breakdown and had been deserted. King Henry VI was taken to the Tower of London. Richard of York persuaded Parliament to pass an act which said that he, Richard, would be Lord Protector for the rest of Henry's life, seeing as he was having another mental breakdown, and that when Henry died, the throne would go to Richard and his children rather than Henry's son. Richard's hands were now so close to holding that king, that the crown of England. But he had reckoned without Margaret of Anjou. There was no way that she was going to let Richard take the throne away from her son. She fled to Scotland, where she convinced the King of Scotland to supply her with, with an army. And with this new army of Scottish mercenaries, she crossed the border and headed to York, the northern capital of England. Lancastrian supporters flocked to the ancient city to join her. Now, now Richard had to act, and he marched his army north from London. On the 30th of December, 1460, he met the Lancastrian forces at the Battle of Wakefield. Now, just now, I said that, you know, the Wars of the Roses were like this, this tennis match, going backwards and forwards, one side winning, then the other, then the other. And so it was at Wakefield. You know, Richard had England at his feet, and then he metaphorically fell at the very last hurdle. He lost the Battle of Wakefield. And he also lost his life. 
Margaret of Anjou had his head cut off and displayed on a pike on the city walls of York. And the hopes of the House of York now rested on his teenage son, Edward, the Earl of March, who was down in the family lands near Ludlow. And within weeks, he was going to face his own crucial test. Meanwhile, Margaret marched south from, from, uh, from Wakefield and she met Warwick and defeated him at a second battle at St Albans. And at the end of that battle, she was able to actually rescue King Henry. Everything was turning out very nicely for the Lancastrians again. And at that moment, a Lancastrian army marched out of Wales to finish off Edward at Ludlow. It was led by two veteran Lancastrian commanders, Owain and Jasper Tudor. And we're going to hear about that name again in a little while. Despite being only 18 years of age, Edward produced a stunning victory over the Tudors at the Battle of Mortimer's Cross in Herefordshire. And with that victory under his belt, he now marched to relieve London, which was still loyal to the, to the Yorkist cause and which had shut its doors, city, the city gates, in Margaret's face. Margaret was faced with, well, Margaret didn't really have a choice. She had to move back towards her northern heartlands. And Edward set off in pursuit. On Palm Sunday, 1461, in a snowstorm, Edward won the largest and bloodiest battle ever fought on English soil at a place called Toton in Yorkshire. Chroniclers say that something like 80,000 men fought in that battle or were present at that battle. And what's really interesting is that the, the casualties amounted to nearly 28,000 men killed or wounded in one day's fighting. Whilst King Henry and Margaret were able to escape after that battle and, and fled to Scotland, their cause had been blown out of the water. Everywhere, former Lancastrian supporters submitted to Edward. And in June of that year, 1461, he was crowned King Edward IV of England at Westminster Abbey. Now we have this slightly awkward situation. There are actually two crowned kings of England knocking around, Edward IV and Henry VI. Once more, Margaret regrouped the Lancastrians and Henry and the Duke of Somerset, a key advisor, key, key supporter, invaded the north of England. But the tide was running with the, with the House of York. And once more, the Lancastrians were defeated, this time at the Battle of Hexham, up near Newcastle. And Henry was forced to go on the run. Uh, he was on the run for several months, going around the north of England. And finally, he was captured in the early part of the following year in Lancashire. Yet again, Henry was removed to the Tower of London. Over the next few years, relations between King Edward IV and his staunchest ally, the Earl of Warwick, deteriorated. Not least because Warwick disapproved of the new king's secret marriage to a commoner, Elizabeth Woodville, and the elevation of her minor family into the halls of privilege and power, the places where people like the Neville family, the Earls of Warwick, believed that they should preside. By 1470, things came to a head and Warwick rebelled against Edward. He actually marched into London and he freed Henry from his captivity in the Tower of London and paraded him through the streets of London as the rightful King of England. And this is, I guess, where, where Warwick gets this title, Warwick the Kingmaker. Yet everything he touched, he, he'd, he'd helped Edward IV to the throne, and now he'd deposed Edward IV effectively and had reinstated Henry VI. This sudden turn of events uh, caught Margaret of Anjou, Henry's wife, on the hop. She was over in France, uh, raising an army to invade England and free her husband. Meanwhile, Warwick could really do with, uh, with those soldiers that she was raising in England because Edward and his younger brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, were on the war path. But time wasn't on Warwick's side. Edward was marching on London and Warwick was forced to march out and meet him without Margaret's valuable reinforcements. In April 1471, at the Battle of Barnet, just north of London, Warwick, the Kingmaker's luck, finally ran out. He died as his army was defeated. Once more, Poor old Henry VI was bundled off to the tower. I mean, he probably could have, he probably could have gone there at homing device. He could have blindfolded Henry and he'd have known how to find his way to the tower by this stage. Ironically, on the very same day as the Battle of Barnet, Margaret of Anjou landed in the southwest of England at Weymouth. Realising that her army was too small to take on the victorious Edward by, by itself, she decided not to advance on London, but she actually turned her army and rushed north to try and join the Lancastrian's most loyal supporter, based in Wales, Jasper Tudor. Together, their two armies would be a match for Edward. And Edward was all too aware of this danger 
and he raced out of London to try and intercept Margaret. Before she could cross the River Severn and enter the safety of Wales, Edward met her army at Tewkesbury in Gloucestershire. The Battle of Tewkesbury dealt a crushing blow to the Lancastrian cause. Henry's son and heir, Edward, Prince of Wales, the person that Margaret of Anjou had been fighting so hard to keep the throne open for, was killed in the battle, and Margaret herself was captured in Tewkesbury Abbey. She was processed in a caged wagon as uh, Edward paraded in triumph through the streets of London. And on the night of that, of that triumphant entry, Henry VI died in the Tower of London. Most accounts say he was murdered on Edward's orders. Now there was just one King of England, Edward IV, and the House of York were triumphant. And meanwhile, the House of Lancaster were well, basically had ceased to exist. Their king was dead, their queen was exiled to France, and the only son and heir was also dead. And meanwhile, Edward IV had a son and a daughter with another son on the way. He also had two brothers who had all both, both produced sons of their own. The House of York was stuffed with male heirs and they reigned supreme. There was hardly a cloud in the sky. But there was one. A solitary cloud, a long shot, a real long shot for the Lancastrians, but a hope nevertheless. Far away in Brittany, in France, a 14-year-old Welsh nobleman with no battle experience was living in exile with his uncle, Jasper. He was the great, great, great grandson of King Edward III, and his claim to the throne was shaky at best. His mother, Margaret Beaufort, the great-great-granddaughter of, uh, of Edward III, had given birth to him when she was just 13. And by then, she had already been a widow for two months, and this 14-year-old in Brittany was called Henry Tudor. But for the next 14 years, he really wasn't about to amount to very much in history, and indeed, he may never have. But in 1483, Edward IV died suddenly. He was only 42. You know, it's one of those what-if moments in history that, you know, I find fascinating. What if Edward had lived another 20 years? I mean, would Henry Tudor have bothered to challenge this military strong, popular king in England? And when he died, you know, his eldest son would have been in his 30s, and he certainly wouldn't have needed the, the, his uncle to act as a protector for him. But Edward IV was dead, and his son, Edward V, was a teenager, and Uncle Richard did become the protector of England. In the interest of time, I don't want to dwell on this chapter of England's royal history, although I do in my series of talks on the Wars of the Roses, uh, which, which I did last year, because Uncle Richard, Duke of Gloucester, put the young king and his brother in the Tower of London for, safe, for, for their safety. And then he proceeded to announce that his brother's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was actually illegal. And therefore, young King Edward V was illegitimate and therefore couldn't be the king, nor could his brother. But there was an obvious alternative. And so Richard himself was crowned King Richard III of England. And what of his two nephews? Well, they were never seen again. And so we have that, the mystery of what happened to the princes in the tower. Richard gets a bad press from history, not least because William Shakespeare made sure he did. Uh, certainly, certainly Richard was not as popular as his brother. And the fact that he had done some, well, let's call it pretty fancy footwork to deprive his nephew of the crown and then place it on his own head didn't help matters. Nor did the fact that the princes in the tower had disappeared under his watch, and nor the fact that he'd spent most of his time in the north of England during, uh, during Edward's, Edward IV's reign, governing the north on behalf of his brother, which meant he hadn't been in London winning friends and influencing people, the people who mattered at court. All of this gave Henry Tudor a window of opportunity that he hadn't really been expecting. And it really was quite an incredible op uh, window of opportunity. At the midpoint of Edward's reign, about six years previously, the male line of the House of York comprised of King Edward himself, his two sons, his brother, the Duke of Clarence, and his son, and finally his younger brother, Richard, Duke of, uh, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and his son. Against that, the male line of the House of Lancaster consisted of, well, Henry Tudor, and even his line was somewhat dubious. But now, in 1485, two years into Richard's reign, 
everything had changed. Edward was dead, his two sons had disappeared, the Duke of Clarence was dead, and Richard's own son had died too. The House of York only had Richard left, and Henry Tudor seized his opportunity. In 1485 he landed at the head of a tiny army in his native Wales. Marching east, he met Richard's army at Bosworth Field on the 22nd of August 1485. And this was a battle which was fundamentally, it was winner takes all. And once again, I don't want to go into the ins and outs of the battle, but the upshot was that Richard became the last king of England to be killed in, in battle. And suddenly Henry Tudor, of all people, was the last man standing at the end of the Wars of the Roses. Henry was crowned at Westminster Abbey, Henry VII of England, the first of a new royal dynasty, the Tudors. But that, as they say, is another story. Well, there you go. I hope you enjoyed that romp through English history, a crucial piece of period in English history. It was a real gallop. As I said earlier, you know, 30 minutes really doesn't do justice to a 30 year civil war. But I hope it started to join some of the dots for you, started to explain what the Wars of the Roses is all about. I hope it's piqued your interest to hear more uh, or indeed to ask questions. Please do so in, in the, you know, by email or in the comments, comments section. Uh, there's loads more I could talk about on this subject and maybe I will in the future. But in the meantime, take care and I'll see you very soon.